So what we're going to do today is talk about five ways to identify hazards. And as it says, this is a free webinar from the Safety Artisan. So just to get us started, I thought I'd better let you know, you know, what, what am I doing here? Why, why should you listen to me? And, uh, you know, I've been doing this job, uh, system safety, engineering and the like for 25 years now. And I've worked on a lot of projects, aircraft, all kinds of aircraft, fast jets, helicopters, big aircraft, ships, submarines, uh, air traffic management systems, a little bit on trains and some stuff on software. Software is everywhere. And I've worked on some really tiny programs, which is which is great. That's really nice to some enormous programs. So we're talking, you know, multi billion dollar programs, uh, including Eurofighter and the future submarine. And um, not all of those programs went well, I have to say. But you learn from the failures or we should do. So um, actually, that's to your benefit because you get to learn from my mistakes which some very famous national leader once said was a good idea. Uh, and I've worked uh, many years in the UK and now I've been in Australia over 10 years. And I've also worked on a lot of US and European programs. So I'm familiar with many different ways of doing things. And we don't all do things the same way. Uh, and it's good to understand that. Uh, I've been very fortunate to teach safety to hundreds of people in the classroom. Uh, years ago, I worked for a firm in the UK and we had the contract to teach all the safety courses to UK Ministry of Defence staff. So I was involved in that team and I really enjoyed doing that. So I got to teach hundreds of people there and in other settings and also now thousands online because we're doing everything online, including this. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to present on safety topics at several international conferences as part of my job. So that's all that's all about me. That's enough about me. Let's move on. So we're going to talk about this webinar topic today because because some people may be out there thinking, well, you know, I've got to do safety. I've been asked to do something to do with safety as part of my job or I want a new job. I'd like to earn some more money, but I don't know how to get into safety. How am I going to do that? It seems like a, a difficult proposition. And in some ways it is because there's not a lot of quality system safety engineering training out there. Uh, and what there is is very expensive. And of course, you've often, you know, you've got to sign up, you've got to pay for it. You've got to spend hours and hours doing it. So to get any kind of safety qualification takes a lot of money and a lot of commitment. So understandably, people may be feeling, oh, I can't do this. How am I going to break into this? Well, hopefully that's where people like myself come in who can come to your computer and feed you safety knowledge in bite-sized chunks so that you can, you know, so that you can eat the elephant one bit at a time. And uh, I've said, you know, where do I start? Um, because really hazard identification is where it always starts in safety. So I thought, well, that's as good a subject as any to start with. So for hazard identification, we need to be aware of four things. So what we're doing is we are imagining what could go wrong. And I want to emphasize, first of all, imagination. So we need to be open to what could happen. Uh, that's the mindset that we need. And we're looking at what could go wrong, not what will go wrong. So we're thinking about possibilities, not certainties. So that's the, that's the mindset that we need to have when we're doing this work. The second thing is that it's very easy to dive down a rabbit hole and get into mega detail about one particular thing and spend lots of time, waste lots of time doing that. And that's not what we need to be doing. We need a broad approach. We need to be going wide 
and thinking about as many different possibilities, as many different possible hazards as we can, not diving deep. That will come later. The, the depth of the analysis will come later. And really, another aspect of that point is we're talking hazard identification. We're just here to identify hazards. We're not here to try to assess them yet. And another mistake that people make is to try and jump straight to fixing the hazard. Um, many of us watching will be engineers. We love fixing problems. We like to solve problems, but we're not here to solve the problem yet. We're only here to identify it. So we're going to avoid the temptation to jump in and try and come up with a solution. Again, that's not what we're doing with hazard identification. So some four things to bear in mind. Let's move on. So I've said that this was entitled five ways to identify hazards. There are, of course, many, many ways to identify hazards. But I just thought I'd pick on these five um, because there was a nice broad range of things and things that I can show you how to do straight away. So the five things that we've got and we'll have a we'll have a slide on each one of these. First of all, we can ask the workers or end users or their representatives. Secondly, we can inspect the workplace. We can look around for hazards. Uh, and maybe we've got a real workplace that we can look at, or maybe we've just got a representation. We can do both. We can use a hazard identification checklist. We can survey historical data, so all the squiggly lines at the bottom of the screen. There's an example of some historical data. And we can conduct uh, a number of analyses, but the one I've picked on is functional failure analysis. And we'll see why in just a moment. So those are the five things that we're going to do in the next hour. And uh, we will have time for question and answer session and uh and also some some more work on the webinar so let's continue so as it says the first thing we can do is ask the workers and there's lots of good reasons for asking workers about the hazards in their work because they know their work and they know the workplace if they've been there any length of time and of course, we need the workers' cooperation in order to manage hazards. And a good way to help us get that cooperation is to listen to them in the first place. So uh, that's going to help us build a bond of trust, hopefully, between us and the workers. It's not always present. Sometimes, you know, people see, you know, the safety person as a threat or somebody who's going to make their lives more difficult. But we need to, you know, we need to get across to them. We're trying to help them do the job well, not get in the way. And then thirdly, I mean, in many countries, it's the law. Certainly in Australia, it is a legal requirement under uh, work, workplace health and safety law to consult with our workers about hazards and things that affect them. And so it's a, it's a criminal offence not to do so. And maybe that's the case where you are. So I don't know where all of you are, um, but um, in many countries, I suspect it will be a legal requirement, a regulation that we have to do this. Now, it's worth saying that maybe we don't actually have a workplace right now. Maybe we are developing a new system or we're thinking about buying a new system or doing something different. We're just exploring the concept. So maybe we don't have any workers on, the, on our system in our workplace because it doesn't exist yet. So how do we consult with workers then? And I still think it's necessary. Well, what often happens on projects is that you have a representative of the end user, of the people who will use the product. And certainly on projects I've worked on, we would have a project sponsor who is usually from the user community and has often 
operated and, and has experience of systems like the one that we are um, developing. So not the exact system, but something similar. So for example, when I worked on the offshore patrol vessel project, we had a Navy commander who was experienced in, in working on and, and commanding and directing uh, the small, I say small, um, patrol boat and small warship operations. And so we could talk about hazards to that person and say, you know, what about this or that? And he would say, no, that's not how we do it. Or, yeah, that's not a problem, but this is this is or this might be a problem. And this is how we typically solve that. So we were able to come up with stuff that was consistent with the way things operated in the real world, even though our ship didn't really exist yet. Talk some more about that example in a moment. So that's asking the workers as method number one. Secondly, we can inspect the workplace. Uh, and just looking around, as it says, can tell you a lot. So if you looking around a building where people work, you can see the equipment that is there. So maybe we can look around and we can go. These are the sources, let's say, of energy or toxicity in the workplace. So sources of energy, we can say we've got, uh, you know, we've got uh, kinetic energy. We've got things that are going to be moving. We've got potential energy. We've got things that are, you know, at height and could fall. We've got sort of mechanical energy in the form of, of pressure. So maybe we've got pressure vessels or pipes with gas or liquid in under pressure, or we've got sources of temperature. And then what, what toxicity have we got? What, what hazardous chemicals have we got? What, where could um, bacteria be lurking, you know, in a air conditioning system, for example? So, you know, a classic Legionnaire's disease, high, uh, you know, lurking in air conditioning systems and can kill people. And every so often there's an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease around the world caused by improperly maintained air conditioning system. So, you know, we can just look around and see sources of, of hazards. And while we're doing that, by the way, we need to think about not just normal conditions of work, but what happens in abnormal conditions? You know, what happens? So if we've got a vat of liquid over there. What happens if we have a leak or a spill? How are we going to safely clear that up? Or how are we going to start the workplace first thing and then shut it down safely? Maybe there are extra hazards with start up and shut down. Uh, and what about emergency conditions? What do we do if the electric fails and all the lights go out? How do we get people out safely or if there's a fire? So there are lots of different scenarios that we consider just looking around the workplace and actually being there will help us to do that, to, to imagine these things. Uh, it will prompt us to think about how things might be for the workers. And harking back to the development scenario, well, what if there is no real workplace or what if it's inaccessible? What if we can't see it for whatever reason? So what have we, have we got some drawings that we can look at or blueprints? Uh, and these days, of course, maybe there is a 3D design that we can look at on the computer. Do we have pictures or videos? And going back to my example about the offshore patrol vessel, we had those kind of things. We had 3D design. We had models of the ship, which was extremely useful. And we also had a sort of interactive video where you could walk through every compartment of the ship. It was a little like playing one of those old fashioned adventure games where you decide which room to go into. So we could go through all the spaces of, of a very similar ship, not the exact one we were buying, and see what was in that space and how you got from one space to another. And you could look around and get your bearings and understand because you, you look at a you look at a drawing, you look at a sketch or a blueprint. And it's not always terribly helpful. So that 3D view was was fantastic, really helpful. Or maybe we might have a, a computer graphic representation of that. So there's lots of possibilities these days. 
Or maybe there's just a similar thing that we can look around just to get an idea. Or if there is no similar system, then maybe we can create that similar system. Maybe we can say, well, our new system, it's going to be a bit like this, but it's going to have these systems and these new features. So let's pull all of those things together. Maybe, maybe they already exist in different places. Let's pull them together and make a, a collage, if you like, a bit like those detective things on the TV where they have all the pictures linked together. And maybe that will help us do a good hazard identification job. So there's lots of lots of possibilities out there. Now, the third thing we can do is we can use a hazard checklist. And hazard checklists are great. You can get uh, general or specialized hazard checklists from various sources online, uh, often for free. Uh, and if you're a member of a specialist society or something, or an industry group, maybe they've got a specialist checklist for the, for the kind of stuff that you deal with. And checklists are fantastic for breadth. Remember when I said we need to go wide, not deep? Well, checklists are good for that. And checklists force us to consider everything on the checklist. So we should go through everything on the checklist and, and be open minded about it. Uh, and that way we get the maximum benefit from using the checklist. Now, a couple of things to note about checklists. They tend to drive us towards causation. So they tend to list causes rather than hazards or consequences. And when I say that, I'm presupposing the model on the left. So on the left, we've got an accident sequence illustrated where we've got multiple causes can lead to one hazard. And then that one hazard can lead to multiple consequences. And what you see there illustrated is often known as a bow tie, excuse me. So it's often known as a, as a bow tie because that's what it looks like. But the, the idea is we're moving from causes to a hazard to consequences. And checklists tend, not always, but they tend to push us to the left hand side to think about causes. So from there, we would have to infer the hazard that would arise from the cause. But that's OK, because that complements other techniques, because other techniques like looking at the workplace or using, you know, consulting with workers, they might well be thinking about consequences, things that they've seen or have happened to them. Uh, or we might be looking at accident data, which is, I think, the next one, number four, um, which again is going to be looking at accidents because it's accidents that get reported, not near misses or you know nothing happens that doesn't get reported accidents get reported so this checklist technique is going to be a great complement for for that approach so the historical data is going to look at one side of the equation and this is going to look at the other so that's great and that's why we use multiple techniques because different techniques have different strengths and weaknesses, but witnesses weaknesses. And if we use different techniques, then we get the best possible result. So method number four, we can survey historical data. And this is something that I see a lot of projects simply not doing, um, which is a great shame because there is a vast amount of data out there and I think we don't always appreciate just how much data there is out there for free, you know, just out there on the Internet waiting for us to discover it. And there's lots and lots of different sources of this data. So on the right hand side, for example, I've just got one graph from a report and it comes out every year from the European Maritime Safety Agency or EMSA, and they do an annual overview of marine casualties and incidents. Uh, and so they look at ships as both a workplace where people get injured and killed, and also the ships themselves can have accidents. They can collide and catch fire and sink and whatever, what things that accidents that ships have. And so this is a fantastic report. So if you have anything to do with, with ships or marine operations, 
I recommend looking at this report because there's a fantastic amount of data and analysis in there and it's really good quality. I'm probably going to do a session just looking at that kind of thing one day because it is so rich in, in information. So good regulators and safety agencies will produce reports and data like this. Uh, also, industry bodies may do the same, sometimes commercial sources. So I think, for example, of, I've done a course on functional safety with one of the big providers that do that, that have the license to, to do that. And they often uh, are heavily involved in the process industry. So they've got lots of data about failure rates in, and so forth in different situations. And they often publish that as a book, which you have to buy. But I mean, it's, you know, it's a hundred dollars, let's say something like that. It's relatively cheap. So there may be commercial sources of data. Uh, and also, of course, there may be standards and guidance published online. And, you know, as I've said, there's the internet, there's this vast source of data out there. And of course, these days, we may use AI and machine learning tools to help us search on the internet. So we don't even have to do the search ourselves now. We can, you know, we can instruct an, an AI bot to go out there uh, from either what it's been taught, usually from internet content, or to go out and crawl the internet and find answers for us. So there's lots of tools now that can help us do this, um, whether or not they're explicitly identified as safety tools. Uh, and you can even go on Wikipedia, um, which will yield useful data. When I was on Future Submarine Program, one of the sources that we used was Wikipedia, because some enthusiasts had put together a list of every submarine accident and incident that was publicly known about. Um, so even in the very secretive world of submarine, if a submarine has a serious accident and people are hurt, it often gets reported. So we were able to get quite a lot of data because there's been quite a lot of submarine accidents over the last you know, 100 years. And so we were able to gather quite a lot of data, which was surprisingly useful. So when people would say to us, this kind of accident has never happened, we were able to say, no, you're wrong. It has happened and it's happened several times. And here are the circumstances. And these are just the instances that we know about. You know, all the near misses and the scrapes and bangs that never get reported, you know, we can infer that they're there. So. We've got to interpret this information sensibly, but nevertheless, there's a ton of useful stuff out there, which is really, really helpful. And now the fifth example or fifth technique we're going to talk about is functional failure analysis. And basically this technique is we think about something we want our system to do and uh, it's easier to talk about examples. So in the example on the left, uh, we've got, uh, it's an aircraft and we want the function we want is for the aircraft to decelerate on the ground. So we might want to slow the aircraft down when we're landing or we've got a rejected takeoff when we're taxiing or whatever. So those are the situations. So we think about this function and we think about what could go wrong. So what happens? First of all, loss of function. What if it doesn't work? What if we don't get any deceleration when we need it? Obviously, if we're landing, well, that's really, really bad. What if we get deceleration when we didn't want it? So maybe the plane is taking off and the, for some unknown reason, the brakes jam on halfway down the runway. That's not ideal either not as bad as loss of braking in some circumstances. but And then what if we get incorrect function? So maybe the brakes work, but only intermittently or not as well. We've lost performance, uh, maybe because we're skidding on the runway or whatever it might be. So, uh, and there may be more than one version of incorrect function. So we might have, you know, too early, too late, intermittent, 
not enough, too much. We, there's, there's a number of variations we could have on incorrect function. But these are the three basic prompts that get us to think about that. And I have to say, usually people are pretty good at thinking about loss of function. We're not so good about thinking about the other two. Um, and the other two are actually usually more dangerous because they're, they, they may be hidden failures or, you know, the things happen unexpectedly and can be disastrous. So, for example, on a plane, if the thrust reverse buckets deploy in flight, very often it results in the plane crashing. So that's bad. That uncommanded function is very bad. Um, whereas if we look, if we didn't get thrust reverse on the runway, well, we've still got brakes. We've still got aerodynamic braking. There are usually other methods. So that's the a very brief overview of the technique and we'll we'll go through how to do it later after the q a session and this in my view is the most cost effective hazard analysis technique or hazard identification analysis technique that we have there are many others and there are variations you know you know i mentioned different kinds of incorrect function, you know, where you've got keywords like, you know, too much, too little, too early, too late. Well, that's we're getting towards what's called a HAZOP, okay, with that approach or um, or other techniques that are out there. So there are lots of different techniques for doing this. I think FFA, you get most bangs per buck for your with your FFA. And the great thing about FFA is you can apply it very, very early you can be at the concept stage. Now I've heard some people, even some very experienced safety practitioners say, oh, you can't, you can't apply, you've got to have a design before you can identify hazards. Absolute rubbish. You can apply this at the concept stage and in the example, we will do so. So I've talked through five techniques, uh, which is great, but what do you do next? So for next steps, I've got some resources for you to help you get started. So first of all, uh, as you may have seen, if you signed up for when you signed up for this, uh, there's a free preliminary hazard identification and analysis guide, and that's available for you. And I will put the uh, I will put the links to this in the comments in just a moment. And so we've got that guide, which is, uh, as you see, illustrated there. So that's about 50 pages and it's got information on all the techniques that I've just mentioned and some others. So hopefully you will find that useful uh, for the next four days, actually, because it started yesterday. I'm doing a 60 percent discount on my hazard identification lesson. So normally that's 45 US dollars. But for the next four days, it will be available to you for only $18 US. And to get those, you will need to sign up for my free email subscription, which has got uh, a lot more content and discounts. So free content that will be delivered, videos and so forth, and some more discounts. So there's some resources to help you get started. Uh, varying from the free to the cheap. And of course, there's a ton more of resources and lessons at safetyartisan.com. Now, so this is the first webinar in a series. So it's just the start. And we will continue through the system safety process in later webinars. So there is a there is a structure to this series. So before we get to questions and answers, I just wanted to let you know that uh, today we've done five ways to identify hazards. And on the uh, commonly used system safety standard, that is task 201. So this is in the MIL standard 882E standard. Um, and there are many standards out there, but this is as good as any to teach with, and it covers all the things that we need to know. So that was that's today's. 
Next month, in mid-April, we're going to be talking about foundations of safety assessment. So we're going to talk about preliminary hazard analysis and system requirements hazard analysis. More on that in a moment. In May, we're going to talk about how we identify and analyze functional hazards. So physical hazards, yet yeah, we're very good at identifying and analyzing physical hazards. Functional hazards, what can functionally go wrong, that's often more challenging. So we're going to have a session about that. We're going to talk about workplace hazard analysis in June. Uh, so that's health hazard analysis and operating and support hazard analysis. So operating our system and sustaining it, maintaining it, that kind of thing. Um, those are both very commonly used and necessary analyses. And there's a lot of different facets to them. So I think that's going to be quite an overview session um, because we're not we're simply not going to have time to get into the depth but nevertheless it'll get the, the purpose of these sessions is to get you started and then in July I want to talk about hazard analysis within a systems engineering framework so we're going to be looking at system hazard analysis and subsystem hazard analysis and system of systems hazard analysis so we're going to be looking at those three different levels of uh, how we break down a system and how we put systems together and think about their interactions. So that will be in July. All right. So that's the program to come. And just to give us a little example, one of the things. So next month's webinar, I'm going to be talking about foundations of safety assessment. And I'm going to be using this model again, the, the bow tie model with the causes, hazard and consequences. And we're going to be talking about how we start a project. So we do preliminary hazard identification, which is primarily there to identify hazards. But we also end up identifying causal factors and consequences. We're also going to do some identification of safety requirements and looking at the requirements of the system. So we're going to do some system requirements as an analysis and looking at those um, system requirements. What do we want the system to do? What could be the hazards associated with what the system does? And that requirements analysis will do lots of things for us. One of the things it will do is it will identify that, you know, the laws that we've got to obey and the regulations and the standards that we might use, but also it identifies control because maybe our customer has given us some requirements that are actually, well, I want you to control these known risks like this. This is what we want. So straight away, you get some controls identified for free, as well as all the other stuff that we can get from the requirements. We can then do some analysis from thinking about going from causes to hazards and hazards to consequences. And there's lots of different techniques out there. We'll talk about those. And then finally, we can do some analysis of controls because you know we've got these risks, we need to control them. We need to do something about it to reduce the risk typically. So we can look at controls and the reason that they are dashed vertical lines is the idea is that they're barriers but they're imperfect barriers. They're barriers with holes in. And this is known as you may have heard of the Swiss cheese model. So the idea that you've got, you know, slices of cheese with holes in them like Swiss cheese. So we need to understand that controls are not always, in fact, very often not 100 percent effective. And uh, we need to take that into account when doing our work. So there is a very quick overview of what we'll be doing next month so i hope uh, you'll you'll join me for that 